from the origin of the universe. Dr. Slezak admitted tonight that the universe began to exist, and he disputed the causal premise. I gave two reasons, however, to support the causal premise. First, that it's an obvious metaphysical principle. And he said, well, what are the rules of your metaphysics here? Well, look at the two sub-arguments I gave for why it's obvious. I said, in the case of the universe, prior to the Big Bang, there's not, not even the potentiality of its being. But how could something become actual if there's not even the potentiality of its existence? And secondly, I challenged him to explain, if things can pop into being uncaused from nothing, why doesn't anything and everything come into being out of nothing? Why just the universe? I can't see any answer to these questions, and therefore it does seem to me we have good metaphysical grounds for thinking that it's impossible that things just pop into being like universes uncaused out of nothing. But secondly, this is all academic anyway, because I pointed out that the causal principle is a universally confirmed and never disconfirmed principle of empirical science, so that it does meet the very standards of proof as an empiricist that Dr. Slezak uh, wants. So certainly I think we have more reason to believe that first premise than to deny the premise, and that therefore it is more plausible than not to believe that the universe had a cause of its existence, which was a personal, timeless, spaceless, and immaterial creator. Secondly, I argued from the fine-tuning of the universe to intelligent design. And here Dr. Slezak dropped his arguments about the equal improbability of any universe, or if the universe weren't life-permitting, we wouldn't be surprised. Notice what he as an atheist has to believe. He has to believe not only that the universe just popped into being uncaused out of nothing, but that when it did so, for no reason at all, it was inexplicably fine-tuned for the existence and evolution of intelligent life with a complexity and delicacy that simply defies comprehension. And I say, if that's the best shot that atheist has to offer, then let those who decry the rationality of theism be henceforth forever silent, because nothing could take more faith to believe than that. Thirdly, I argued about objective moral values. And here he simply said in his last speech, well, what do you mean by absolute and objective? I defined what I meant by objective, values that are binding and valid independently of whether anybody believes in them or not. And it seems to me that if God doesn't exist, then moral values aren't like that. They're just products of biological and social evolution. On the atheistic view, we're just animals, advanced primates, and animals don't have moral duties to one another. So it does seem to me that we have good grounds to think that without God, moral values are just subjective and relative. But if you agree with me that our moral intuitions are sound, that there are certain things that are truly right and wrong, then you will agree with me that God exists. What about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus? I refuted his apparent death theory. He says, well, there must be more naturalistic explanations. Well, what are they? Modern scholarship recognizes no plausible naturalistic explanation to the resurrection of Jesus. And finally, what about the immediate experience of God? He says, well, it could be delusory. Yes, it could be, but you need to give me an argument for that. In the absence of arguments for atheism, why should I deny the reality of my experience of God through Jesus Christ? God has been a living reality to me ever since I uh, experienced the spiritual rebirth uh, at the age of 16, a reality I've walked with for over 30 years. And I believe that if you will seek him with an open mind and an open heart, this is a reality that you can find in your life as well. Thank you. Well, Dr. Craig uh, says that uh, I should hold that uh, we should see more evidence for God's existence, and he's exactly right. Um, in my position, I think that if one looks around, the question is, why is it so hard to be a believer? God makes it very hard for skeptics, and if he's omnipotent, uh, it seems to me that one could get better evidence. Lots of agnostics make this point. The, agnostic, uh, the atheists, rather. The atheists aren't, in this case, um, dogmatically, as it were, opposed to the possibility. It seems to me that I like to claim, although my students laugh occasionally, I claim I'm open-minded. I would just like to see something that's reasonable. You know, uh, God declaring himself in some way that is unambiguous and uh, hard to refute. I think even the most staunch believer has to uh, admit 
that. There's nothing quite like that. And in fact, um, I was going to say this earlier, but uh, I haven't said it now. Many of you profess to have deep uh, beliefs uh, and, and strong convictions, but you have to recognize that, of course, your strong convictions about the belief in God are different from a lot of the other things, which is evidenced by your being here. If we announce that we're going to have a debate next week on whether the Harbour Bridge exists, I don't think many people will come. And so clearly your strong convictions about some things are very different from the other things that you believe. So the question is why you have strong convictions which are so uh, uh, disparate and so different in their, their grounds. Again on the causal principle which uh, uh, Dr. Craig uh, raised again, he I think um, suggested in his last words, I quote from what I understood him to say, that the causal principle has never been dis disconfirmed as a principle of science and he's relying on that. I don't think that's quite fair. In the remarks which I think I quoted, but certainly are in his uh, writings, he is explicitly acknowledging that the principle, as I think I said, is not from science but from metaphysics. And he can't rely on the, co the, the scientific notions of cause which are confined in their domain of application to within the realm and certainly <clears throat> are not thought to uh, be relevant to the entire universe under the current standard theory which uh, Dr. Craig is relying on. So uh, it seems to me that uh, the notion of cause that he's appealing to, which is the common sense notion which we all respond to, is misleading here. And in fact, the notion of cause which he has in mind is one which philosophers call, and he's referred to this uh, in connection with the philosopher uh, Swinburne, he refers to the idea of what's called agent causation. Agent causation is a notion which comes from human behavior and an attempt to explain the human will, how we seem to move our limbs, as it were, out of nothing. Well, even within the realm of human behavior, this is a questionable and, in fact, uh, probably redundant uh, notion, which is suspicious when it's thought to be in conflict with the ordinary scientific cause that we understand from within our science. And so, in fact, uh, both Swinburne and Dr. Craig speak of the personhood, as we've heard him say, of the uh, cause of the universe. This is not exactly Michelangelo's bearded man in the clouds reaching out his hand, but it's pretty close. Thank you. I must say that one of the only things I didn't enjoy about tonight was uh, really seeing two people who are incipient friends of mine fighting in public. Um, that wasn't very enjoyable, but the rest of it. We do, uh, I, I think it would be appropriate if we thank the two speakers because they're not here like in some of the televised great debates which are much more about entertainment than substance. Uh, because they're paid, they've come out in their own time uh, to debate serious issues and to help us think it through again. So I'd like us to thank both of them again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you to speakers and uh, have a good trip home. Thank mm -hmm. you.